Okay. Um, all right. I guess good good evening. I'm, ass I'm assuming we've got some East Coast, we've got some Midwest, and I'm hoping that's not afternoon for anyone at this point in time. I want to say thanks again for, for joining us today. So I'm Cheryl Neeser. I've kind of been the host a few times in the past. We share that um, with Improving as a Scrum Master Coach. And um, I really want to say thank you to those um, attendees that are returning and also those that are new. So it's always encouraging to see that our mission and our vision and our event um, topics are interesting enough for more people to continue to join our um, Minnesota Agile community. So just really quick, um, wanted to say for those of you that are new, I wanted to just kind of re recap who our team is. Um, Julie Rue is not able to join this evening, but she is with RBC and she's a core member of our leadership team. Chris Wickett, we see in, in the upper corner. She is um, presenting tonight. And so um, again, she's she's been very core since the beginning of trying to get this uh, meetup kicked up and up. And uh, Cheryl Anderson, she's been core as well. She is also with Improving and she um, is also our great producer. So can, we could not do this without Cheryl Anderson. Um, in addition to that, we've got a couple other people that have been um, with us from the beginning, Craig Schumann, he's with Freebridge and also Orpio Consulting, Angie Agresto, who's not able to be with us tonight as well, but she is with um, Agresto Consulting and Training. And then um, we do have Mark Strange with us tonight. He um, he is <laughs> like what we're calling a member at large these days because he's been really consumed with some other, other work and um, hasn't been able to join in a lot of our meetings, but we're not gonna let him go. So I'm the prodigal son. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just really great. So um, I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, Mark's been able to join us as well as the rest of you, because I think tonight's topic is going to be just really interesting and and um, good conversation um, for the team and hopefully great learning as well. So um, our mission, again, is that we know there's lots of opportunities, um, especially with uh, virtual sessions for you to attend many, many different groups any time of day. So we really appreciate the fact that you, you are attending our meetup and we wanna make sure that we can provide the space to build a strong community for those that are new on their journey as well as those that are um, farther down the road in, in terms of their journey and in terms of um, living agilely. So um, thank you all for joining. We really want to welcome you. We want your um, input. We want you to let us know if the topics are interesting, if there are topics that we haven't covered yet, and then um, anything else that you would like us to like focus on so that it enriches your lives. So we really appreciate that. Um, and so I, the one thing I want to say is that before I you know, ramble on too long, <laughs> because sometimes I have a tendency to do that, is that we do have our September topic event out there and some people have already registered and signed up for that topic. It's going to be Michael Sahota talking about um, how to grow from being just, you know, not just, but a servant leader into an evolutionary leader. And um, as part of the meetup next month, we will be giving away five copies of the Sahota's new book called Leading Beyond Change. So we hope that you'll join us next month as well. So now I will get into the fun part of introducing Chris, Chris Wicket. I'm really happy to be able to introduce her tonight because um, I met her a couple of years ago at a Twin Cities Agile event and I had heard all sorts of wonderful things about Chris. And I just remember in that flurry of like so many people and pizza and everything else, you know, finding her and saying, hi, Chris. You know, I was enthusiastic and she's probably going, go away. But um, <laughs> since that point in time, I've been really lucky, um, really, really lucky, I think, that I have had the opportunity to work with her on a more regular basis, on a weekly basis for some things. I've been able to take advantage of, you know, her expertise and her advice on a number of topics. Um, so I, I really do feel, you know, that all those great things that I heard about her not only are true, 
but that I can now take advantage of them as well by having a connection with her on a regular basis. She's a principal consultant too and an enterprise agile coach with improving. And she brings years of hands-on experience leading large corporation, agile transformations, leading teams of agile coaches, um, training, teaching and coaching executives. She's teaching them on the um, leadership values, agile values, principles. She's also been able to um, promote continuous improvement and servant leadership in the organizations with which she's worked. And um, in business and IT agility, I've attended her presentations on what is business agility. So I think mm -hmm. that those things um, are really critical for a lot of people to understand and learn and be able to leverage her knowledge in the current work environments that uh, we're in today. So she just really um, has a lot of experience. And so I'm, I'm really, really happy that she has um, agreed to share, yeah. you know, what's the big, what's your big picture um, with us tonight? You know, she's, she's really very passionate and enthusiastic about, um, about, um, you know, What's the word I want? Um, I guess it's, it's that um, strategic thinking, you know, systems thinking, as well as, you know, um, lean portfolio management. She understands that very well and how to work with clients to make them understand as well and help their organization. So she has been consulting at various Twin Cities locations, uh, client locations. Um, she participates in panels. She's got amazing facilitation skills. I said one day to her, I'm like, I want to be you one that grow up. Yeah, I, I truly mean that. So um, she's she's um, very enthusiastic and I appreciate that as well. So she loves her puppies. Um, she loves sports and playing ball. She loves uh, water skiing, which is like, in my mind, it's like crazy, but that's okay. And she's back living in Minnesota, her home state and um, enjoying all Four seasons. So with that, I want to say thank you, Chris, and we'll turn this over to you for sharing what's your big picture. Awesome. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for the shout outs, you guys. I am blessed um, to be partnered up and partners in crime with you guys in the community and so on. Um, so thank you. And as we go through tonight, we want it to be interactive as much as possible. So we'll try and answer questions, um, talk about the different approaches and really um, to the, your point, Cheryl, my passion is really trying to simplify things and have fun and um, provide value to customers. Um, I was blessed to um, be part of the American Airlines family um, to Cheryl's point, I was born and raised in Minneapolis, moved down to Dallas for 32 years, uh, worked at American Airlines for 31 of those years, and led their agile transformation. And um, what was crazy is we started that journey um, right after the Agile Manifesto um, in 2003. And so we had a big, huge corporation that we were moving into an agile framework, into an agile mindset. And there wasn't a lot out there. Uh, so we blazed a lot of trails. And so that's a part of the world that I want to share is how did we get here? What are the different approaches? And then just really have good conversation because it's all about the different styles, continuous learning. I always say I'm a work in progress. So um, thank you guys for your time and the opportunity to share some stuff. So without further ado, hopefully I can do this. Uh, we practice Cheryl and here we go. Let's see. All right, so as Cheryl mentioned, I'm with improving, but we're gonna get into um, what is your big picture systems thinking. Big room planning is what BRP is. Uh, PI planning is program um, increment planning. Can you hear? Yeah, okay. Um, we also called it product um, planning too. One of the things that the culture that I grew up in, we had to, um, we wanted to keep things industry standard as much as possible, but we also had to um, tweak words to assist in getting different mindset and different behaviors. But the intent was always noble on behalf of keeping it from a 
um, an industry perspective. So that's a really important part when you look at um, this kind of presentation or conversation that we're gonna have together is the spirit of it is always trying to figure out how do we connect strategy to execution? And if I had one thing that I could do differently, I would have a whole bunch, but the biggest one that I think I would say is understanding what systems thinking really means um, sooner in my journey. And again, a part of that was um, a lot of the agile frameworks weren't out there. We didn't have scalability. And when I say scale, I am talking systems thinking. I'm talking the whole organization. So I know there are many different definitions for scale, but for me, that's what I'm talking about. So coming in with that context, it's systems thinking. And it's not about applications. It's about that whole system, all of the community that we need working together to deliver value to our customers. So we're gonna demystify a little bit of that and then kind of dig into the planning and monitoring also and the benefits of that mindset change. Um, to the point where Cheryl mentioned about the um, lean portfolio management and so on. That is the team. We were a traditional PMO at American Airlines and we decided to move into more forward thinking. Um, and we really ripped our bandaid off. Um, like I say, we started with iterative and incremental in 03, but in 09, 2010, we really ripped the bandaid off and we went full speed into an agile framework. Um, but again, we're the world's largest airline. We had a lot of things that we had to keep going. We have, you know, just like a lot of the financial institutions that I've worked at now moving back to Minneapolis. Uh, we had a lot of regulations, a lot of audit, obviously safety and so on. So we had to think of ways to bring in opportunities for alignment and so on, but also keeping the mindset and, um, you know, and changing that mindset. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight too, is why did we do things? We were very deliberate when we deviated from certain things. Um, so we'll talk about that and why it's so important on behalf of that sustainability. If you talk to any of my team members from Dallas, um, I was blessed to manage a team um, of coaches and a development team and so on. But the two words that I said, all the time, is that sustainable and is that scalable? Um, and that's where, to Cheryl's point, my passion lies. So my goal always, always, always is to think about it from simplicity. So if we look at number 10 principle, uh, maximize, maximize the amount of work not done, that sounds really simple. And yet simple is hard. And what I always wanna do is, especially um, in the roles that we're in, leading change, leadership, anything, is reward simplicity. It is not easy, complicated is easy, complex is easy, and our job is to weed through all of that and try and figure out the easiest way that we can remove that complexity, minimize our dependency, and make sure we're delivering the right value at the right time. Um, sounds super simple, but we know it's not. And so that's the spirit in which um, this conversation is all about. So like I say, don't be shy. I can't see the comments, so don't um, hesitate to interrupt me. So this is, again, what is your big picture? And if I, again, look back at my journey, um, continuous um, work in progress at the same time, I would say my big picture is that agile frameworks start with the ideal, but it's up to us to make them real. They are really needing to, we have to figure out based on our culture, based on the way that we can sell things, the way people will buy it, based on our influence, they, frameworks are just a starting point. And then we have to figure out how to make that happen in our world. And so from my experience, I have never taken one framework out of the box and implemented it. Now there is a degree of risk doing that, um, but there's also a, de a degree of risk of the approach that I suggest is taking bits and pieces of the different frameworks, but being very deliberate um, of what the intent of different parts of frameworks are and ensuring that they work collaboratively and ensure that at the end of the day, it's all about flow and minimizing the gap between planning and being adaptive. Um, that again is the big picture that we're looking for when I talk about that. So that's the spirit again of this conversation is taking a look at the different approaches and figuring out how we can make them real. So big room planning, PI planning, whatever we want to call it, it's a technique to assist with connecting strategy to execution. At the end of the day, that is what we need to do. We need to figure out how do we get all of the strategic stuff and the great ideas that we have out there, but making sure they're the right thing at the right time and driving that into execution. 
Um, and it's fun to see that things have gotten better along the way. And I, continue, um, I expect that they will continue to be enhanced as we go. So if we look at this, and again, scale to me, it's not hierarchical. Scale is all about figuring out from the system perspective, how do we decompose work into smaller pieces, get it done, and then push it out into production to get that value back to the front, from the customer to the customer and so on. So with that, when I talk about connecting strategy and execution, it is literally looking at the corporate objectives and then figuring out how do we drive that from strategic initiatives. We have that business backlog. We have all of the players, if you will, at that portfolio level that assist us with that. And they do strategic planning. Um, some may not be doing strategic planning yet. And that is one of the things that we want to see as happening is that we have to be both strategic and tactical. Um, and somehow that kind of got lost a little way along the way. And so that's one of, again, my passions is to make sure that if we're getting really good at execution, we need to expand that to further out in the system, then how do we connect that strategic initiative into our business outcomes? And that again is at that product level, a, not a hierarchy, a decomposition of work. Um, using the technique again of um, objectives and key results is a really cool way to drive the business outcomes. This is again also where we want our teams to have autonomy. In the um, previous pictures in this, um, we used to have the word features here in which the product management or the product folks would decide the features and then hand those to the teams. And what we've since done is evolved that to say, no, 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 no. You tell us what the objectives and how will we measure if we're on track or off track. And we will then as teams figure out what features can support that. So this um, change is really, really important to make sure that folks see we're not handing team solutions. We're saying these are the outcomes we're going for and you guys tell us how we get there. And so changing this from handing solutions to the teams is not easy. And that is again, part of the bigger picture and the evolution of agile transformations as we're going forward. That is a very different approach than we used to have a few years ago, but one that's really hey, important. Hey, Chris, do you mind if we jump in and ask questions or do you want yeah, us to- Yeah, please. I know several people are putting questions in chat oh, cool. too, but I don't think you can see them. I um, cannot, I, I, thanks. I was just yeah, I was just curious where you draw the line um, between when you're talking about business outcomes and features. Um, it, I, it sometimes becomes a little bit difficult, particularly like with a UX team. How does that figure into this mix? And where do you typically draw the line? How, how do you enforce or, or encourage the product team to work in the realm of business outcomes versus features in a tactical sense, what do you do? Yeah, one of the techniques I'll, sh um, I'll share that we've used in the past is called um, big room planning countdown in which we do um, weeks ahead of big room planning. We have different activities for different outcomes and UX is one of them to assist in that flow of information so that we are decomposing that work and breaking down that information and providing that just enough, just in time. So we'll come back to that when we get to the, um, the countdown. So make sure to keep me honest if we don't address it that way, but that's specifically how I have seen it work really well with UX and all of the different players, if you will, of helping us to figure out how can we get the, that alignment, but also give the teams some flexibility in that space. But also when we are dealing with things at scale, we are having to put some constraints on things so that we can get alignment to deliver that value. So we'll come back to that, but it's called the big room um, planning countdown. Have you heard of that? I have not heard of the countdown. No, I'm okay. excited to learn about it. Perfect. Chris, one other question. Um, why is it hard to remove complexity? <laughs> um, my opinion is that over the years, and again, coming from a very large um, corporation, we didn't have the lean mindset. And so we added, as we added, we did not lean out. And so because of that, I think that added a layer of complexity and actually um, some complication, if you will. But the complexity is when we did not lean things out and we just added more, my opinion is that's what drives a lot of the complexity. Another part 
can just be size. When a business model of an organization is to acquire different companies and you're integrating different business models, different, um, different approaches, different methodologies and so on, that again drives complexity for us to figure out how do we weed out this waste and really lean out the, um, the environment. And so from my perspective, that's what dry, why it's hard for complexity. Um, if I had my druthers boy anytime, and I've been through quite a few of these, uh, leaning out before you start integrating would be a huge benefit. Any, any other questions in that space? That's it for now. Thanks. Okay, cool. And please, thank you, Mark. Don't be shy to interrupt you guys. So this is, again, the spirit of this is flow. Think about a river. Um, and yeah, I thought I was just thinking about that here in Minnesota. For all of you guys, we know that we have a drought. But normally, the river is flowing, flowing, flowing. And that's our job, if you will, is to help the information and value flow in our organization. And the technique of big room planning or program um, increment planning, product increment planning, whatever you want to call it, it is all about that consensus-driven planning to get that buy-in and commitment. And the spirit of it is, is that if we're all part of the conversation, whether if it's virtual now or if it's um, in person or whatever, that really, really helps to make sure that we all are, have that same understanding. Um, it can assist with having fewer meetings and so on, but it's really about that active participation understanding and going in with our eyes wide open about risk. Risk is everywhere. And if we really want to mitigate it as much as our companies say we do need to do it, then understanding that and everyone having a really a part of that conversation and the logic of why is this important? How did this get decided? Just being part of that community can really assist with that. Because at the end of the day, we have to align to the overall mission. That is really up to us to figure out how we're gonna do that. And as you guys know, once we plan and then we plan for the plan and plan for the plan and then life happens, what do we do? And that again is another benefit of everyone being part of that planning process so that they can understand again, why, what was the intent? Why were we doing this? And to assist with everyone understanding that changes are gonna happen. We know that. So let's embrace that and go in with our eyes wide open and figure out how we can do that. So that is the biggest thing is that one goal and keeping that flow of information. And this is again, where that countdown will really help to see how it all flows together. This picture for me, like I say, if I could do one thing over um, in understanding systems thinking, it is that is what brings in scalability. That is the big thing that we have to understand. What does our big system look like? When we hear the term systematic problems, that's coming from this perspective. It's not about applications. It's about our whole ecosystem in our company. So even if we're doing agile at the team level, if we're not expanding that out further and further, then we're really not able to take advantage of the benefits that agile brings us to the maximum. Sure, we can do that at the team level and there is really good stuff there. But what we're wanting to do is really get that um, further out to the customer and so on. And we wanna make sure that we have that scalability thinking. Then we get into lean. And like I mentioned about complexity, um, this would probably be another part of my journey. Um, had, we, had we really leaned into lean, pun intended, we would have been able to understand that sustainability is about removing at the same time as adding. So as we're adding these new mindsets and we're adding these new tools and techniques, we also need to be removing that waste. And so lean is a really big part of the two passions I have, scalability and sustainability, of keeping that flow going and removing as many dependencies as possible. We then get into agile, and we know that that's an umbrella for many different types of frameworks and so on. And again, our job is to make frameworks real. How do we incorporate that into our culture? How do we um, incorporate funding? How do we incorporate vendor management? There are all these other things that the frameworks are pretty silent in. And so you, for you guys, you know when you're executing, we don't have the luxury of being silent on a lot of those things. And especially in the role that we had when we were transforming our PMO, we had to take all of those things into consideration because then we get down to more that team and local level. And that's where Scrum really can assist us with that predictability and Kanban with our flow. So this is, again, that big picture of understanding how it all fits together, 
why is it important, and coming back to how can we keep it as simple as possible. So again, that's the spirit of what I'm always trying to keep in my mind when we're uh, making decisions and we're designing our agile frameworks for our, um, for our systems, if you will. Now, that said, I wanna make it very clear. I embrace the frameworks that people come out with because they've done the hard thinking, there's the smart people and so on. So I take what they've got and use that as a baseline and that we all have that same understanding. So it's not that we're just creating things for the sake of it. It is creating things to make sure that it is simple and lean as we can in our system. This is a really good video. It's an oldie but a goodie. Um, we'll send out, I think we post these decks. I don't know, Cheryl's, but um, if you haven't seen this video, I would just Google. Um, it's a Spotify video on autonomy um, and alignment. And what's it's really important, and this is again bringing in the, um, the technique of uh, um, objectives and um, key results, OKRs. At the end of the day, when we have high alignment and high autonomy, that is the sweet spot we're going for. We are wanting our um, leaders to say, here's the objective. Here's how we know if we're on track or off track. You guys figure it out how we need to do that. So the video talks about if the problem is we want to cross the river, then the leaders can tell you that you have to do it. We're going to cross the river and I'm telling you, you need to build a bridge. Well, that might be high alignment because I'm telling you what to do. We now have low autonomy. So this is where we have to start transitioning our mindset into if these are the problems, these are the opportunities, then what are the features, the functionality that can assist with that? However, as we all know, it's just a guess and it's just an estimate when we're doing that. So we want to make sure to get it in the hands of our users sooner rather than later to see is it the right thing at the right time? Because if it's not, we're one closer to being right from a feasibility perspective. And that again is that mind shift change that we need the whole system, that whole organization to understand because our business cases change, the way that we prioritize projects and initiatives change. When we go to more of this high alignment, high autonomy, our whole system needs to change. Now that said, it's not changed like ripping the Band-Aid off, it's incrementally figuring out how do we get that information of flow? How do we decompose the work into smaller batches? How do we minimize that gap between planning and being adaptive? Um, but this is a really powerful video. It's like two minutes at the most. Um, highly recommend you guys take a look at it. If I wasn't afraid of technology, we would watch it right now, but eh, I'm not that um, confident on it. So any questions? Have you guys seen this video, any comments? All right. I don't think I've seen it, but I'm going to go watch. Yeah, it's a really good one. And it's a great one to share with the leaders because, and sometimes you don't even know that you're doing it. The other thing I want to show here is if we have low um, alignment and low autonomy, we don't even have leaders telling us what we've got going on or, and it shouldn't be leaders telling us anything, sharing information. That's what it is. Um, and then if we have a low alignment, but high autonomy, uh, we're kind of in that cowboy crazy. And what I will say, when Agile first came out um, for a highly regulated um, airline and safety being a huge concern, obviously, uh, when it was peace, love and Agile and everybody just did things, I couldn't sell that to the organization. Our team couldn't sell that to the organization. So we constantly had to figure out a way, how do we get this to high alignment and high autonomy so that we are able to do the job of execution and connecting that to strategy? Because then we also bring in the different five levels of planning. Um, we were big fans of Mike Cohn, um, still a big fan, but that's where we really started to rip the Band-Aid off to start to get to do things differently. We wanted to, again, bring that work into that decomposition of understanding what is our vision, our roadmap, doing release plans. Um, if you're a scrum shop, calling them sprints, we were not a pure scrum shop, um, so we called them iterations. Again, we deliberately changed names to get different behaviors. It wasn't until we ripped the Band-Aid off and went more to the planning onion that we were able to make traction and people saying, huh, what is this? What is that? Now that said, roadmap is one that can be risky because everyone kind of has their understanding of what a roadmap is. So that again is an opportunity to figure out through big room planning, PI planning, call it whatever you want. That currency of features is what we want to have on our roadmaps. That is where the business 
can have that common currency. That is where the IT folks and our customers, because even when I am using my cell phone, I'm taking advantage of different products, but their features are why I go back to those products. So we want to embrace that currency of features. And that is an, um, one of the techniques that we can take advantage of in big room planning. Then again, release planning. By intent, we imposed um, release time boxes because when we moved from projects to products, we wanted to impose time boxes so that we really could understand what is the value that we're delivering. Uh, so at a bare minimum, we did that in quarterly chunks and you'll see that. And then we continued to make our sprints or iterations smaller and smaller as we went along on the journey. Um, but that again is another opportunity for different ways to break things down. This is, I'm a very visual person, even though I can't draw. Uh, this is again, an opportunity to show no matter where we're at in our system, we can use this as a decomposition of our work. This can be used at the portfolio level for strategic initiatives. Um, it can be used for features and so on. And so what we wanna do again, when we have complexity, we want to make sure that we are um, assisting in some guardrails to help to decompose that work and keep the flow going. So we wanna have that vision. What is that business value? What problems, opportunities are we going at? How can we get there? This again is like I mentioned, we impose time boxes so that we are saying this is a bare minimum of value. We want to deploy when ready. If we have an organization that is so mature, we've got our DevOps and all of that, deploy when ready. I would never hold back on deploying things when they are ready. Because again, from the lean perspective, that would be waste. But if you're just starting your journey or having issues with trying to figure out how can we make this work, this was one of the techniques we did is for um, imposing that time box so that we had a boundary, we could manage the expectations with our leaders and really make sure that we were delivering the value and then get the learning because that was another part of evolution. We needed to see our people using these things as this the right thing at the right time, because if it's not, this is where we go back to our vision and roadmap and we tweak it for the next release. So we do not plan, whoops, sorry. We do not plan all of these out. As you guys know, they are fuzzy as we go forward, but we do wanna have an intent of what are we trying to accomplish and how will we know we're getting there? Did I see hey, any Chris. questions at all? Yeah, Yes. Yeah, I have a quick question. So uh, this is kind of back to my original question. On your roadmap, are your roadmap items features or epic, feature epics or are they business uh, problems to be solved and yes. who manages in your yeah. in your new view who manages the roadmap um in when i'm in portfolio at that higher level from that enterprise picture these um are more of the what would call what safe would call portfolio epics um if i'm at the product level these would be features because i think i have another one where i have them as features so the answer is yes it, this was a way that we managed small, big batches into smaller batches, no matter where we were. So if it was at the portfolio level and we had a year long initiative, if you will, we would break these down into smaller portfolio epics, if at all possible. Um, and we might even just have one or two that because we wanted to really find out, are these the right things at the right time? So it can be what wherever you're at in your system, this can be used at, for that. So yes, it can be safe, um, what I would call portfolio epics, um, but it also can be at the feature level. Does that answer your question? Kind of. I, I was curious, though, earlier you had mentioned that you were trying to avoid um, dictating to the team's uh, features and instead giving them business problems to solve. Are you including then the product managers and the product owners as part of the, the team that are defining these feature epics? Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, when I'm at portfolio epics and in that, yes, absolutely, absolutely. They are part of that conversation as it is moving from that portfolio into that product world. I have my objectives and key results, my hypotheses, if you will. And so absolutely, they're part of that okay, conversation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because I'm used to seeing you going from the OKR to an initiative yep. to directly to the roadmap. I was curious if you had another step in there where you're saying, hey, team, um, I don't care how you do this, but just solve this problem. Yeah. Nope. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying because, nope, I'm in alignment with what you're saying. Yeah.
Yep, I, I got you now. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? And I really actually, appreciate you clarifying that. Yeah, I think actually that that might have confused me more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the at the portfolio level, it's the OKRs. Um, at the portfolio level, there are yes, there are okay. objectives, if you will, um, and key results. Yes. Yep. And yep. they are then decomposed into smaller parts of that, if you will, or they can be that same portfolio epic that are brought to that product level to say, here guys are the objectives that we're looking for and key results. And that product team um, is assisting with that um, to be part of their world to then hand those to the teams to say, now teams, if these are our objectives and key results, then what are the features that you guys think could assist with that? Because it can sometimes break down um, from my experience and you guys um, probably have um, more experience in this space, but portfolio epics um, from a safe perspective and hypotheses, if you will, still might be too large that we break those down at the product level into different ones because it might be a collection of products that assist us with getting the objective at that higher level. That's how I've done it before, is that those objectives and key results can, can break down again at that product level to the different teams. Does that help, Angel? Um, I, I guess I'm getting confused in, in, I don't know if it's the colors that are necessarily throwing me off or each of the different colored boxes. And okay, let's talk at the portfolio level, each of them an o, a, a different OKR. It, yes, it could be. It could be or not. Um, chances are probably not as much, but it could be. I would say this was more just from the concepts of trying to break things down, um, because to your point, it fits better from a feature level. But the visual is just trying to represent that this kind of can assist of breaking big things down into smaller pieces. Because your OKRs might not, they might be small enough that you don't need to decompose them to multiple teams. Yeah, we just had so many dependencies that we ended up having to do that sometimes. Cool, I like I like that relationship. I have to process that a little bit more, but yeah, like. <laughs> yeah, I can understand. Yeah, that's where this complexity and um, simple is hard. Exactly. All right. Well, we'll keep going, and then I'll make sure to come back and um, make sure that we've got it addressed. So this is again, lean principles. Um, I really, really wanna make sure as folks are going through their journey and especially leaders, I think this is an opportunity where they hear lean and maybe don't understand it as much. And it's really, as you guys know, about eliminating waste. And as leaders, we should be looking around all of our ecosystem to say, what can we remove? How can we get the fastest way for learning? And that is through small batches. And that is, again, the whole reason why we want to get feedback. We want to make sure that we're getting, doing the right thing at the right time. But that's because we're amplifying our learning. And that is sometimes um, you know, scary for folks to think that. But that is what assists us in mitigating risk. Anytime that we can touch it, feel it, see it, we are amplifying our learning and we are mitigating risk. Now, some folks might say, oh, but then we're, we, um, we have failed because something doesn't work. And I always say that again, as I mentioned earlier, that's one step closer to being right. Because the sooner we realize that we're not on track, the faster or sooner we are expecting or hopeful that we can get back on track. And that's the spirit of making sure um, the lean principles and amplifying the learning sooner rather than later. And that's what brings us to number three. This can make people nervous sometimes, but one thing that I should add in here is decide as late as responsible. And that is a really big part of this, is that we want to decide as late as possible, but the word responsible needs to be in there also. As you guys know, that's why we impose time boxes. However, we don't have the luxury of making a decision on the last day of a time box. It's all again about that flow and making sure that we've decided the last responsible moment because we want to deliver as fast as possible. So that again is getting that smaller batch so that we can figure out and get that um, deliver as fast as possible so that we then can figure out are we working on the right thing at the right time. And 
going back to that portfolio, um, at that portfolio level, are we solving the problems? We think we have key results that we can increase customer service, decrease costs or whatever, but until we get that objective data, we don't know. And so getting that feedback bi-directional is critical. And that is, again, coming from a traditional PMO to a forward thinking, you know, um, agile PMO. That was the biggest thing for us is we wanted the objective metrics to start to help make um, data-driven decision making. Uh, we still always have subjective, but if we could do more objective decision making, looking at things objectively, there's always plenty of work to be done. We don't need to worry about that. That's why we want to make sure that we're looking at the data and we take the emotion out of the work and we put the passion in delighting our customers and making money and saving money. And that is a big mindset change for a lot of organizations. I was kind of surprised um, once we started showing you know, objective data a lot of the leaders weren't used to that. They were used to seeing subjective things. And so it was hard for them to get used to that. So that was again, a mind shift change that we needed to help them with. Um, Cause that then really empowered the team, pushing as many decisions down to the team, removing um, all of that hierarchy going up. And that's why I say, when I'm talking scale, I'm not talking hierarchy. I'm talking about pushing down decisions, pushing down the work, to that smallest batch possible and getting it out um, because we want to build integrity in. You guys who I work with and you hear me say this all the time, I am about zero, zero known defects in each sprint or each iteration. We want to build integrity in. We don't want to negotiate if this defect is better than this one and that I grew up in the business and having to work with things that were the blue screen of death, which I was a green screen person uh, back in the day. Um, but I didn't want to have something that I had to do a workaround. I would have rather have fewer features and less functionality and more quality. And so from my perspective, um, on behalf of Lean, we have to be fussy and we have to build that integrity in so that people trust that what we're doing is mitigating risk and by the smaller batches we're able to hold that quality in high because that is then when we see the whole. If we are not fussy on defects and we are building in technical debt, we're not seeing the whole picture. It's a pay me now, pay me a lot more later. And that's where, again, we want to make sure that we're um, feeding this into the um, whole system. That's going, why going back to big room planning, PI planning, call it whatever you want, everyone who's working on delivering this value is working together and understanding the whole because of the dependencies. As you guys know, it can be like dominoes. One thing gets off track and it all falls down. And that's not what we want. We want to be very proactive in this space. So really um, being fussy in this on lean, it can be really helpful to going back to what we talked about earlier of removing complexity. So now, again, it talks about delivering value. And there's my word again. Um, and we want to make sure that we know our dependencies are easily managed. We, um, we will always have dependencies, in my opinion. I would love to say we won't have them, but we want to minimize them. And what we have to do is manage them. And so figuring out the best way that we can do that is always the goal. And at the same time, we wanna lean out our organization. So we have to figure out what is the bare minimum that we can do with our dependencies and then making sure that we're monitoring and keeping it on track. Because if we get off track coming out of the planning session that we are all on, we all need to understand what the implications are. Um, again, understanding we want to be deliberate in embracing business changes, but we want to do that deliberately. Some may debate to say that if you're planning in three month um, increments, that's not very agile. If you can plan in shorter times, that's great. I think that's wonderful. But when you're looking at big organizations, medium organizations, lots of dependencies, lots of different um, parts of the system playing in that space, that can be challenging. But I am an advocate, deliver quality when ready. Um, you wanna make sure that you're always delivering, but at a bare minimum, make sure that you're doing that planning, if you will, quarterly. Risks, I am all about risks. You've heard me say that and about the team member. And what we wanna make sure is that, that continued communication across the program. Um, because at the end of the day, we do need to have controls on these. I'm not talking micromanaging. I'm talking going back to that video, alignment and autonomy, because if we have alignment, we have more autonomy and that's the better way to control things. 
So this is again, where I talk about coming from my traditional PMO. And what's funny is if you do any type of um, uh, behavior profiles on me and stuff, I'm not a process person, which is crazy because I managed a process group for most of my career. Uh, but that's maybe where my passion comes is trying to figure out how do we simplify it and still make sure that we can, um, at the end of the day, what's the scope, schedule and cost that we're trying to deliver for the value of our customers. So you guys have probably seen this slide before, but this is when we start moving from that project mindset into the product mindset. Um, you know, safe calls and value streams, you can call them product teams, uh, whatever it is, have them be persistent teams. We want the work coming to the teams. We want to talk about outcomes. What are we trying to accomplish and how will we know we're getting there? That's where we get into those metrics that matter, objectives and key results, getting that feedback from the customers. Are we delighting them? Are they getting frustrated? Really getting good at the analytics. Technology's come a long way to assist us with that. Um, but growing up with a big legacy company, a lot of the legacy apps didn't have the analytics that we needed. So that's when the, we would put time and energy into figuring out how can we make, get some analytics out of the, these leg, legacy applications. And if we can't, that is a degree of risk that we got to figure out how are we going to mitigate. So metrics that matter in the more modern ways of working are really, really important. It's not the traditional time, cost, and scope when I'm talking about it. I'm literally talking about objectives and key results and getting that real feedback from the customers. This is again, instead of what does it cost, we know what it costs when we go to persistent teams. We simplify the cost. Now, as a business and as a system, what is it worth? What is it worth for us to get this out in production? Are we going to leapfrog our competition? Are we keeping up with our competition? What is it worth for us to do that? Because that starts to be part of the decision making at that portfolio level. We are wanting to figure out how fast can we get it out there? Because what is it worth for us um, if we get it out there? And then you guys have probably heard of the ter term, what is the cost of delay if we don't get it out there? So coming at it from that perspective is really an important part. Talked about stable teams, cradle to grave accountability. As you guys know with DevOps and all of that, if you're the one developing and you're getting the phone call at night, that can really help with building that quality in, accountability, and it just really helps with everybody understanding what the product does. It can help us to think, be creative, be innovative, and deliver those products that we're proud of. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, is that ownership for those products and delighting our customers. And it's kind of funny when I say the word delight, you might see that I, um, I giggle a little because when I first heard that term delight our customers, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And then I got to thinking that word is really, really an important word because there's a difference between me just sitting here and taking things in as a customer compared to the applications or the products that delight me. There are two different worlds for me. And so once I started to really think about what products do delight me and why do I go back to products, that's the key that I want to always make sure that I'm delivering. And that's my passion of helping other teams and um, organizations to do that, is to really delight our customers and have fun while we're doing it. So when we talk about a release, release has two, word, two meanings in this context. A release is a time box, again, to assist us with delivering value. And release can mean to deploy to production, but that's not what I mean here. This is where we have a container for value. Um, again, back in my previous world, people wanted to say we can't use the word release because we use that for deployment too. And that's where we have to be mindful that many words have different meanings. So we need to put it in context of when we say different words um, because we didn't wanna change words just to Americanize them. We wanted to make sure that they were industry standards. So that again is a um, opportunity of the big picture. How can you get these words to mean something and then bring context to them? So this is, again, part of the mindset change of balancing the problem space versus solution space. Um, this is Einstein saying, given one hour to save the world, I would rather spend 55 minutes defining the problem and five minutes finding the solution. And this is where I would say myself, big time included in this. I didn't realize that I was speaking in solution space majority of the time. I had no idea that when I would say, well, let's do this, this, and this, I was telling the team the solution. 
So once I started to learn the difference between the problem space and solution space, that again assisted me as a leader, assisted as a team member, and helping others to figure out the breaking habits, if you will, that what are the problems that we're trying to understand? We need to observe them. We need to empathize. This is where we bring in different things like design thinking and so on, that customer centricity. What are the problems that we're trying to solve? What is that purposeful planning? And how do we know if we've solved the problem or not? Now, this is where I also suggest being empathetic to those of us who live in solution world and don't know it. So being self-aware is if I'm saying, I need you guys to go create this, this, and this, going back to that picture of the bridge, I'm providing them solution. I need to step back and say, here's the problem. What do you guys think? What, what do you think we could do? And what can we build to test and learn to see if it's on the right track? So this is a really different concept. And this is, again, part of the reason why when we get into big room planning, we have done the countdown, which is coming up. So I'll make sure to get through that so you guys can see it to see how do we take our problems and then come up with ideas for us to get out into production, to touch it, feel it, see it. But this is a really big difference than what we do today. Um, so kind of being, a, like I say, self-aware of your own style. And if it's a habit that we need to start breaking, and your leadership and culture. Because again, majority of the time when we're creating projects, we're handing them solutions and it's, you know, by intent, probably, but they may just not know that there's different ways to do things. And that's why we take advantage of the other tools and techniques that are out there. So this is again, part of the reason why we want to get uh, everyone in that same system to understand what is our problem and what's our hypothesis of how we think we can solve that. That's where we take on, um, we've talked about objectives and key results. I know there's a hot thing going on, but they've been around for a really long time and they are just such an easy tool. Um, and this is again, where we say, what's our objective? Create an awesome customer experience. Delight our customers, as I mentioned earlier. This is what we want to see happen, but that's nebulous. How do we know if it, it's an awesome experience? How do we know if we've delighted them? That's where, again, this is a mindset change and a discipline that is really, really important. We need to say we need to change from X to Y. The risk that people have is that in the past, perhaps they've been held to a, you know, that if I get it wrong, I'm not going to, you know, I won't get, um, you know, I'll be in trouble or whatever. And that is not what we need to have at all. We need a trusting environment and we need to make sure that that's part of that continuous learning, that it's just an estimate when we say from X to Y. That's just a desire. Even when we do our traditional business cases, which we've done many, many of those, that's just a hypothesis and a guess uh, or a desire of what we're looking to get out of the solution. But until we really start measuring it, we don't know. So one of the techniques I always suggest is when people are doing this, make sure they understand that it's written in pencil. We just need a starting point. If we're finding out as we get those metrics back and we're not moving it the way that we expected, that's the point at which we start discussing, huh, that's interesting. Do we need to pivot or are we going to persevere and see if we want to do something, you know, add this or that, or is it that we've thrown enough good money after bad and we need to stop? So these are not intended to be written in my, um, permanent marker. Even if they're in pen, we want to scribble them out. But we have to have a baseline um, to be able to draw against to say, are we on track or off track? This is, again, where we start to really bring in that objective metrics and taking a look at it. But this can be really scary. And so if your culture is not as embraceive in this space, you guys as um, change leaders and coaches and scrum masters, product owners, all of you guys, developers and every part of this Agile community, help to see the benefit of bringing this mindset in. That it's not to be competitive, to say that you were wrong or I told you so. It's to get a baseline so that we can start to be, make decisions that really are the right thing at the right time. Whether it's making money and saving money, at the end of the day, that's our goal. And so this, this tool can really help. But we have to be willing to take a look at our numbers and, um, and then inspect and adapt. The other bit of advice, um, writing 
simple OKRs is not easy. Again, going back to simple is hard. What we do want to make sure is that we write them from the customer or the external perspective. We don't want to write OKRs from our own internal world um, that we want to you know, have audit or compliance. We should be weaving all of that quality in and still wowing our customers. So as you guys are on your journey of looking at OKRs, writing them or whatever, be really, really fussy that they come from that more um, customer centric and not internal. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the customers and the, um, now if you have internal customers, that's awesome, but don't do it from a process perspective. We want it from how are we delighting our customers internal or external. All right, so this is where I do take advantage of SAFE in this space because um, there's really no other framework out there that has that portfolio, that lean portfolio management level. Um, it's not perfect. I definitely tweak it. And anytime I say, say I, it's a we because it is a community, it is a team um, always working with us and making sure. And even when I was leading a team, it's the team. Yes, anyone have a question? Okay, um, so this is truly with safe jargon, and we did not use this um, jargon, we did change this. Um, so that is another opportunity when you look at the big picture and seeing what makes sense. But this is a Kanban board for all of our initiatives, our portfolio epics. Um, an enabler is a technology solution that assists in getting something ready. So you can take advantage of that. Um, we just weren't ready from a maturity perspective to do that. So we tied everything to business value. Um, if you have questions on that, definitely we can chat about that. But we just had to make sure that we had that business value. And so some of our business um, portfolio epics might be a little heavier because like if, when the airline went to mobile in the sky, that was you know, that was amazing technology that we never had. And so we had enablers, but we tied that into our portfolio epics. So a little bit more detail, but that's how we did it. So anyway, this is again, taking advantage of flow because remember flow is where we are helping to see where we can be lean and mean. And we wanna make sure that we do not have too much work in progress. Our system only has so much capacity. A lot of our leaders have a tough time <laughs> realizing that, that when we are adding more into our system, we need to be fussy to say what has finished or what has stopped to make room for this new work. And that is one of the reasons why if you impose smaller time boxes and impose smaller batches, you can have more things or more opportunities because your batches are smaller and they're being deployed more frequently. And at a minimum, every quarter, we have another batch that we wanna take a look at. A quarter is still a big batch, but it's a smaller batch than a year's worth of work. So kind of looking at it from that perspective. But this literally is that you have whip limits and you only pull when you have the whip limit available. And this is at that leadership level when we're deciding what's the next thing that we wanna do. This is again, taking advantage of safe, um, vocabulary on the slide. We did tweak it a little bit just because we needed the word epic um, was being used way down at the team level. So we added the word portfolio epic and that helped. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that we added clarity. But this is again, when we're being fussy, we should be doing minimal viable products and experimenting here. We are not doing that today in most cases, but that's the goal is to get, instead of all these big bets going out as big bets, our goal, if we're really doing portfolio management with that agile lean mindset, is that before we invest in a big bet, that we get a real experiment out there and we really see, is this the right thing at the right time? We're doing that more at that team and product level, um, but the goal is to do that at the portfolio level. Because again, if it's all about mitigating risk, we want to mitigate the risk of our big bets. Is this the right thing that we're going to do? At American Airlines, we had a lot of things that we went to the mobile app and we had big bets that we didn't validate sometimes. And when we then validate it, they're like, oh yeah, we should have seen that, that they didn't want to do this online. They wanted to talk to a person. So again, that's why we do these things is to mitigate the risk with big bets. What's the smallest batch that we can get out there, get that um, objective data. And then if it's the right thing, we're going to continue on. 
So this is again a technique that can assist us at that portfolio level, which is part of our system to take our big things, make them smaller at that product and then team level. So here's my countdown, Mark. Chris, um, take Chris, a look at it. Yes. Hey, Chris, could you go back just a second to your you bet. previous slide? Um, this, uh, Vlad had a question on how do you determine like your WIP limit for portfolio Kanban? That is one of the hardest things. You have to just guess at first. Um, now that said, if you have the opportunity to have persistent teams um, before even implementing this Kanban board, you have an idea of how much work all of the different teams can get done. Because again, what we're asking is how much work can this team get done? We're not asking anymore, how many teams do we need for this work? Um, so that's a good place to start is if you have persistent teams taking the information that you have today. Um, but in the case in two places that I've recently consulted, we didn't have that. So we first started out by just um, making guesses to see, is this a good limit or is this not a good limit? Here's what actually was going to happen, but this is a big no. And you'll see where I get passionate about this. If we do not have WIP limits, we are not doing Kanban flow. We are just doing Kanban and making our work visible. So to your point, Vlad, put something out there, start to educate the teams and the leaders of what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to make space in our system. So the smaller the batch, the sooner we can add more things and the sooner we can be fussy of what is it worth compared to what is the next thing on the backlog. Because again, there are plenty of ideas in our funnel, but we have to be fussy with our capacity of our team members and keeping that sustainable, scalable pace of what can we get. So it's not a great answer, but just start with something and hold that, that you have to have whip limits of something so that at least you can start to learn and see, is it three or is it four, or maybe it's two. We're doing this right now with our, in our, within our own office and our whip limit right now is two. We started with three or four and we've come back to say it's two. We're only working on two things right now um, because we started to play around of bringing something else in and we're like, can't do it. Bandwidth is too much. I can't be sustainable and scalable at this pace. So we, we changed it down. So that would be what I'd suggest. Start with something. Again, it's written in pencil that you can then um, take a look at and inspect and adapt. Um, you did have a follow on question as well. You said, so what happens if you have to accelerate and expedite product delivery due to a business opportunity window closing. And he also made a comment of like having 10 very busy teams. Does that mean it's a whip limit of 10? But I think the, the first question about what happens then when you do have to accelerate and expedite something because that business opportunity window is potentially closing. Um, so this is where the smaller uh, time boxes you have, the more opportunity you have to change priorities. So this is, um, I'm going to jump to here. Uh, well, I'll stay here. This is where the business needs to be strategic. They should be refining the next things coming up so that we're not doing these last minute changes. We do have sometimes that happens. Definitely. I'll say, and you guys have heard me say this, Delta came out with this, so we need to do it. Well, we should have, from a business perspective, been paying attention to our, um, our competition all along. Now, of course, people keep things you know, secret and they've got these big announcements and so on, but that's part of what the whole portfolio management is all about, is looking at strategy, figuring out what's out in the marketplace, what's the hot new thing coming up, where's the um, innovation that we can come up with and see what we want to do from our business model. So that's part of it, is not being reactive, but being being proactive. So at a bare minimum, they would be able to get that idea in the next quarter. However, I would never hold it back if it is so important that we need to put it in sooner. However, we now have a lot of waste that we need to make sure that that trade out was worth it. Or can we hold off until that next increment so that we can de be deliberate on that um, change in priorities? So it is balancing that alignment and autonomy, but being also strategic and being disciplined to make sure you're changing for the right reasons, because there's a lot of cost that goes with that. Um, so it's anything that we can do 
to provide an environment that enables those decisions to be made like that. However, we wanna do that in a disciplined manner. So the smaller the time box, the better off that we have in that, which brings in kind of the benefit of the business to have this mindset. All right, so this is again where I talk about flow. Now, in a quarter, there are 13 weeks. So you can do this with 13 weeks of countdown. You can do it with five. You can do it with ever you want. But the spirit of it is, is information is flowing the whole time. And this is taking advantage of working backwards. If our big room planning is all about alignment of a dependencies, OKRs, and monitoring of cadence and so on, what are all the bits and pieces that we need to make that happen? That's where we go back and say before big room planning, here are all the things that we need to have happen to keep that information of um, flowing and so that we keep priming that pump so that the next quarter we're ready to go. So one of the techniques in this space is that, yes, we are pulling people off of current work in this quarter, preparing for work for next quarter, because that is part of refinement. That is part of flow, that is part of lean. We wanna make sure that we're doing the bare minimum that we need to do so that we can get the best benefit um, at the right time. So this is an, a technique that we've I've used quite a few times and we've tweaked it because this again is an example and it needs to be your, uh, what is that saying? Your mileage may vary, but it's a great starting point. So if we take a look at it from review our objectives, key results, again, what problems are we trying to solve? How will we know that we're doing it? We wanna start to align those priorities. This is again, where we take a high level look at the different products and their visions and their roadmaps to see who's gonna have capacity. What are the areas that we even need to consider? Um, Angel, this is kind of where I was talking about where we have those nested kind of maybe OKRs that we decompose them a little bit smaller because this is where we then start to look at product teams might have different ones, but I don't want to confuse you guys too much, but this is where that countdown can maybe help because um, this is where it starts to flow from that portfolio to the product and then the team. Again, your mileage may vary. You may have different groups, part of it, but this is again, then we start to align our portfolio epics. I should have put the word portfolio, sorry. Um, portfolio epics to the teams. We want to start saying, hmm, this is what we're thinking about. We want to then get with, now this is risk because we're proposing features and conceptual architecture. And at this point, we haven't brought in the team yet. So again, this one, you might change a little bit, but it's all about flow. If the leads can speak about from the team's perspective, we've got the business, the architecture, whatever it takes to make that happen. But again, it's all about that autonomy so that the, the teams really have um, opportunity to speak up. And that's where we say decomposing the features into user stories. And the minute that they see this is not in alignment, we want to make sure that they um, raise their hand. So this is not written in um, permanent marker. This is written in pencil for you guys to, you know, to tweak as you find necessary. But the why kickoff is an important meeting because what we're saying back um, to our teams, if you will, is leadership is saying, we this chunk of value that you've been working on is great. We can't wait to get out in production and then get the metrics to see is it the right thing at the right time. And here's the next chunk of work that has been prioritized. That's why we call it the why kickoff. Why is this work more important than the work that's been going on and future work? This is where we start to have that purpose of what are we trying to accomplish? Why are we working on this compared to other things? And this is again, if something has changed and the business is saying we wanna keep up with our competition, this is where they are explaining all of that and we're all part of that conversation. And again, you can add the team here. We actually did more times than not. Um, we have the teams be part of that, but that's up to you guys to decide that. Um, I would never exclude teams, but I also want to be um, mindful that they're working on a current um, scope, if you will, and current value that we want to get out there. Um, this is then when we bring in the user stories. And this is, Mark, where we talk about wireframes and mock-ups, is we start to figure out if these are all the problems and opportunities, how can we get the wireframes and mock-ups sooner rather than later? We might end up moving these up further, but we have to kind of balance, as you guys know, we're not wanting to you know, have this um, be so... Um, planned that we can't be, if you will, back to lean and decide as late as possible. 
So we got to balance that of deciding late as possible, but delivering as soon as possible. And that's part of this world is Perfect. wherever it makes sense in your culture, how soon or how late into this can you show those wireframes and mockups? Does that help at all, Mark, on seeing how it kind of fits in with that countdown? I think Mark had to drop. Oh, he did. You're right. Yeah. He gave me a heads up on that. So thank you. I apologize. I forgot. Um, I and then I, know. I, I just want to make one connection just to get my brain. Is this this is system? What what part of this big room planning? Where did this big room planning come? Is this system thinking or is this? It, is, it? It's, okay. it is systems thinking and it's all of the people that are part of getting this big thing into production or this piece of value into production because the business and that portfolio management group are, um, you know, all of the marketing, the legal, the audit, risk mitigation people, whomever, they've already been part of this as they are going through that Kanban board and working through the next chunk of priority. So you're exactly right. This brings in that systems thinking to everyone involved so that we can decompose that work and keep the flow going. Because in this system thinking is very well known. Um, it should be, but I will say I heard the term for many, many years and I didn't get the concept. So that's what this is um, supporting, is that concept. Because we got new leadership at Bremer and they have a 10 week initiative and I have a feeling this is what it is, especially <laughs> on some of the things that I heard. So this is exciting. <laughs> Good. Even better to hear that it's all coming from that same perspective. That's why changing too many things outside of the standards is really risky. Um, but configuring it to your environment is um, perfect. So that's really good to hear. Really good to hear. Um, this one I want to make sure you guys know. Now, this is part of Safe's World 2. Um, I don't know what they call it, but we called it product innovation. Um, but it's really the hackathon. It is allowing the teams to work in the innovation space, literally giving them one week to say, work on your stuff of your product. The constraint that we would put on them is that it had to be in the context of their product, but they would get the opportunity to have a mini hackathon. And at the big room planning, then they showed off what they came up with. And for all of you guys who have participated in that space, as you guys know, it's magic. I mean, it is crazy, even just the tone of the teams when they say, and we did this and we did that, and oh my gosh, what about this? I um, mean, a lot of times leaders are like, no way, I don't wanna take care of, you know, they're busy, they're busy and that kind of thing. But that's where we say, however, we need to make sure we go back to that business ownership and that um, alignment and autonomy and we have to make sure that we are bringing fun and excitement and innovation into our new world. The digital world has changed everything and we want to embrace that. And that is again, when we do this with um, a deliberate one week, the risk is really minimal because we know the cost of it. And when we have to show it off at the big room planning, we get to show the value that we can deliver. At American Airlines, we had one of our um, teams come up with a mobile app that wasn't even on the backlog from the business perspective, but they were so passionate about how they felt that they could do the mobile app that they did it in this product week innovation and the business when they saw it was blown away. So they traded out the priorities and put that in for a future, um, a future release compared to what something else was there. So don't take this lightly, guys. This is a really um, a really important one, but hold, hold sacred with your leaders to say it's predictable and we have outcomes and we're working on our products so that we're, you know, it's not just something willy nilly. Now, I will say something that people will want to sometimes do and I have mixed emotions on it or um, opinions, I should say, tech debt. A lot of times people would like to work on tech debt in this one week. And while you can do that, the risk that can happen there is that you're not bringing in innovation then into your world. So that we're still just doing kind of that maintenance and that um, important work, but maybe not as inspiring work. So anytime I look at that product innovation or hackathon, I think about inspiring and so on. So if it is inspiring to clean up your tech debt and so on, and that you can show that off at big room planning, the value that that brought, 
go for it. But don't use this week as a time to catch up on stuff. Use this week as an inspiring opportunity to innovate and create new value for your customers. And then at the end of the day, we have our big room planning and we do all of that together because again, it's all about us understanding what we're trying to do and get it out there to either make money, save money and delight our customers. Okay, so this is again with that same picture that we were talking about where it is features. So I will follow up with Mark again, but this is literally the currency that we come out with um, from big room planning or PI planning from the configuration that I recommend. And I think SAFE is in the same space, um, but it's features. This is a currency that everyone can and needs to understand. Um, and again, it gets fuzzy. We don't plan out future ones, but at the end of the day, this is what it needs to look like so that we are able to get that lather, rinse, repeat. The process is predictable. The time boxes are predictable. And then we're focused on the value and that innovation and inspiring and delighting our customers. So that's where I say this framework can be used wherever you're at in um, the system at the portfolio product or team level. Because I could even use this for user stories too or epics at the team level. Um, but this is again, a really helpful visual for teams and leaders to see that when we even do this, we are talking that things are deployed and working because we're going for flow. And as soon as that last, um, you know, we're coming out of big room planning, we're going forward and starting to go back into delivering that value. So that's why having that week of innovation and that week of big room planning gives the team an opportunity to take a deep breath and then we go back into lather, rinse, repeat. Okay, so this again is a big part what doesn't happen. And so um, be fussy in this space. If you call them scrum of scrums, call them whatever you want. But once we come out of big room planning, PI planning, we need to make sure we are in sync continuing on. We know life happens. And so it's all about what we all planned. We are part of that conversation. We now understand the value, the priorities. Now, when life happens, we need to make sure that we are keeping up with each other. The term in the industry is scrum of scrums, in which all we want to make sure that we're talking about dependencies, milestones, whatever we're using, risk, risk, risks. We want to make sure that we're taking a look at our KPIs and we're making sure to address the cadence issues. If we've got somebody that's lagging behind, um, that something was bigger than they expected and they're not gonna be able to deliver it through our dependencies, what are we doing to mitigate that and adjust the plan? Because we wanna hold sacred delivering that value to the customer wherever possible. We know that anomalies happen, but we do need to be predictable. Um, I think I was on product tank meetup and it was um, Jeff Patton, I think it was actually said um, about, deadlines and dates in the agile world that if I was going to get my car fixed and the mechanic opened up my hood and said, I'm agile, I don't give you a, dead, a due date of when I can get it done, we wouldn't go back there. So we do have to balance that we have um, dates that we have to live, you know, target, if you will. And it's through the scrum of scrums, PO syncs and so on that we communicate and ex um, manage those expectations. Uh, so that could be something that people don't agree with me on. However, I, again, I think in the real world, we have to have some of that predict predictability. PO sync, this is a, where everyone is understanding what we're trying to do, the priorities. Uh, again, highlighting if we've got things going off track, what are we doing to get back on track? And making sure back to Vlad's idea is if we have something coming up with our market or something, we are preparing if we need to change priorities. I really don't want to go there. Now you can do that with a very mature organization and you can do it. Um, inside your time boxes, but just be really mindful of the risk rewards that go with it is all that I would suggest. Um, and then this one can be debatable too. And again, your mileage may vary, but it's easier to track this stuff. It's easier for the whole system if we are on a synchronized cadence. Uh, debatable by a lot of different people, but I have found I've lived in both worlds and the synchronized cadence is definitely easier and less complex because we all have an understanding of what's expected and what time. The demo review and retro, what I would highlight here is just making sure that we are looking at fully integrated working product. When we are at our system level and we're talking features, 
Generally speaking, it's multiple teams that have to assist in delivering a feature. If your world does not have that, don't add more complexity of adding these tips and techniques if you don't need it. Um, in big companies that I usually work with and that I grew up in, we needed to have, um, we needed to integrate our things sooner rather than later. And that is inside our quarterly time box um, because we're not doing that right at the end and doing a big bang. That again has got risk all over it. So focus on system demos. We need to do that throughout, maybe monthly, that you have those system demos where everything's integrated. You still have your team demos, but we wanna make sure that we are integrating early and often. Um, because if it doesn't work, we need to get that fixed sooner rather than later. Then again, that increment of business value, go back to, are we solving the right problem at the right time? Are we making sure we want to take a look at our customer satisfaction and so on? And then we don't want to be shy on the, uh, at that bigger level inside your big room planning. All of those people, we need to do a retrospective. We need to understand collectively how are things working and what do we need to improve on? We still do that at the team level, but again, we're a bigger part of the system and we need to understand how we're all working together. So this is again what we want to make sure we're doing inside our time box. Then the benefits to our mindset shift is huge. We've talked a lot about that, but this is where we start to really remap how we do things. It's all about that continuous flow. And so from an agile perspective, by us holding sacred our scope and I mean our schedule and cost, we can play around with our scope, but this is where we have to be very disciplined in making sure that we are delivering that value. What are our pro um, the problems we're solving? Get it into the hands of the users, get that feedback. Are we on track, off track? Feasibility is key that we wanna make sure, because that is again, the spirit of what we're trying to do is mitigate risk and have objective decision-making made. I always like this visual to show uh, defined in empirical data. Um, again, it helps with flow. We can deploy when ready, when we are fussy on zero defects. If there is value in each of these user stories, if these are epics, if they're features or whatever, we wanna be able to do that. So it's constant flow of information, constant flow of value. And again, I'm not dissing one over the other. What I'm just saying is the mindset is different and it's all about continuous flow. So how we do things is different. So that's where this visual can be really helpful for leaders to see some of these abstract concepts of why we have to be fussy. Why do we time box? Why do we have user stories if you use that technique? Because we wanna go all the way down and back to make sure that we've got the right thing at the right time. So again, it's all about flow. This is where I talk about that innovation, have that innovation week, if you will, that cadence space, um, make sure that we have the teams have that time for that. It's fun and it shows commitment to innovation and it shows commitment to minimal viable product, that feasibility that we are learning and we are moving into more of that lean mindset. And that's really the spirit of that. This is incorporating that innovation. And kind of back to where we started, simple is hard. So think about where do you wanna be as an organization and work backwards. That's why for any of the transformations, anything that you guys are doing, handle it the same way that we would an initiative or a project or a program product, whatever you wanna call it. Think about it and work backwards. Do we wanna have synchronized cadence? If we do, maybe now is not the time, but are what are steps that we can do to do that? Persistent teams, how can we start to move in that direction of bringing the work to the team? Shortening planning horizons, estimates, responding to change, again, in a disciplined manner, building our quality and upfront predictability. And we all know, which is why you guys are here. Thank you. Thank you for your time um, about continuous learning so that we can get better and better at delivery. Because at the end of the day, my very favorite, one of my very favorite quotes is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. When you look at designs and of products or you go back to using products, most of the time it's because of the simplicity and the sophistication that comes with that. So really, really weave this into your culture, um, help your teams to see this and the leaders. And I always, you know, I'm a Google fan of their search page. I love the simplicity of that how they have held that sacred, that I don't have any advertisements. I just have the bar that I type in. And for me, 
that is the ultimate sophistication because I can't even imagine how many times they've had to fight things off to get the, to just say, no, we're keeping it this way. So this is what I always go for in any of the decisions. And with that, three minutes, but does anyone have questions? Thank you for, um, I'm gonna stop sharing, but thank you for adding them in the chat along the way. Any other questions, comments? Um, on the synchronized sprint cadence, I guess um, going organization wide, um, how did that um, work for you in your experience? It was hard at first. Um, and so we had to plan in advance. We did not do it by ripping off the Band-Aid. We had to be very deliberate and we brought different product teams on at a different time. So like one quarter, we might bring in another group and another quarter, because we, one, their metrics would get all messed up. And two, we wanted to be very deliberate of when we needed to do it. We didn't want to just do it willy nilly. So we were very deliberate. So that would be what I would suggest. Um, is take a look at why we want to do it and the better ways of doing it so that people can see it's not just a check mark, but we're doing it to be able to get value to do things differently. And this was synchronized all the way from the portfolio level down to the team sprints. Yep. yep. All the way to the sprints. Yep. So those that had three week sprints, we had to negotiate to get them to two week sprints. Those that had one week and so on. So we just had to... Um, kind of compromise sometimes. Thank you. Uh, what value did we get out of it, Vlad, is what you're asking? I do. Uh, one of it was uh, predictability, that we were able then for big room planning, we were not having to have it all off, off um, well, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. We were all in quarterly planning. Um, we did annual funding still, and then we did quarterly reviews. So it fit really well into our culture, um, just doing it that way. But then from a reporting perspective, it just provided better data for decision-making. It wasn't predictability from velocity and all of that. Those are not the metrics we're going after. We were doing it from more on behalf of the integration of features and so on, getting it out to production and then measuring back that value. So that I would say it's for the outcome metrics, not the output metrics. I'm not talking team metrics. I'm talking metrics that are back to um, the big bets that we're going after. Anything else? Chris, I just need to know how soon is this video going to be available? So that oh, I no. <laughs> Good question. We'll get it out as soon as we can. And if you guys know me, I hate videos. So for me to do this, yeah. <laughs> so for you guys, I do it, but yes. We'll get it out there, Angel. We'll keep you posted for sure. And we'll get the deck so that you guys can have it. And please don't be shy, reach out to us. Um, answer, que well, answer questions. Throw me some ideas too. I'm always wanting to learn and adjust and inspect and so on. A work in progress, so don't be shy. Actually, Chris, one question. If you were to recommend any particular book or video or something on system thinking, what would you recommend? Oh, I would do um, project from product to Project to Product by Nick Kirsten, I think it is, that one. Um, and then there's another business agility one that I would recommend. Um, but yeah, that one really helped for flow and systems thinking. But I, I'll think of an, uh, I probably have other ones too, Angel, that I'll ping you with too. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to say, Chris, everyone that had to drop early for whatever reason was like, can't wait to see the video so I can oh, no. catch up on what I missed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of like, thank you, fabulous you know, Chris, you're as awesome as everybody said you are. Uh, well, that's sweet. I, I, I'm inspired by you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys keep me coming and think, um, I, like I say, inspired. What's next out there? What's the next thing that we can bring in to bring in that sophistication of simplicity? <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. We'll see you next month with another good one that kind of feeds into this whole thing about leadership.